Assaw, dudes. It's your boy Asian Psycho, aka Toast Sniper 98. It's about that time of the year again to flex all the SSRs that I have in my account. Uh, I mean, uh, make a video on all the five star servants in Fate Grand Order. Uh, chances are you've already watched the other three versions of this video for the past three years, and if you haven't, well, first of all, you're missing out, and second of all, uh, go watch those ones first, and then come back to this one. Links in the description. In case you already have watched the others, just like Rick Astley says, you know the rules around here, so let's get straight into it. <laughs> Fate's poster girl! No, not the CE, the one who's on the game app itself and shows up in literally every Fate promotional work ever because publicity sells. She's THE quintessential gender-bent historical figure, and with how many saber faces there are in the game now, Negi could easily make another bestseller involving her and god knows however many other twin siblings she'd have by this point. She harkens back to a day when things were simpler, when servants were only supposed to have two skills, and you couldn't just nuke entire health bars with a single face card. As such, her skill set is incredibly simple, primitive even, in a day and age when skills need at least two or more effects nowadays to be considered decent. Even with the simplified kit though, Siege's instinct buff turns her into the best general farming saber in the game, which used to be her bastard son's title, because those two are the only two AoE SSR sabers in the game with 30% batteries, which lets them pull off some double MP shenanigans with the support waiver. Or Scotty, I guess, in case you thought it was a good idea to give a buster-focused servant someone who's normally only supposed to buff quicks. Actually, on that note, being called the best farming saver in a game where Scotty exists is like practicing Tetris for a couple of hours and then thinking you'll win more than six games against Suisei. Granted, Morty's anti-Rick super effective damage still makes her superior if saber faces are involved, but outside of those situations, Seba outperforms her own son just because of the simple fact that she has a charisma and Morty doesn't. And for the last time, her name's Artoria, not Altria. Minneapolis is a DPS saber, good for face carding and wave clearing thanks to her high attack and buster AoE MP, much like how she is in Azure Lane thanks to her gunboat setup and skills. And with the two buffs she's got to her skills, she can also double as a one turn crit saber and utility saber by getting rid of enemy defensive buffs so that she and her team can go ham without protection, something Helena knows very well. And according to Romulus, she's also a Yandere, which probably means she's been simping for Bryn a bit too much recently. I knew Echio had a lot of NTR dojins, but I didn't know there was one quite like this. Actually, no way, Altara's been hella simping for Tama lately, hasn't she? The president of the No Saber Beam Club is a crit and burst damage saber with an old fashioned skill set of having only one effect per skill, but with insanely good base stats. No! You can't just be a year one SSR and still be relevant five years later! You didn't even get any buffs at all! What are you doing? Haha. <laughs> Quick cards go stab stab. Even without any buffs, not even an MP buff, Feet Fetish Enabler is such a chad that the only buff she needed was Scotty, unlike the virgin Okta Alter who got a buff recently on JP, and still isn't any more useful in the JP meta. Honestly, the biggest buff Okta cared about is the fact that she finally got a summer version of herself, which she's been asking for for years, though some of you may see that as a nerf instead. Monarch used to be the best AoE saber in the game until her dad, KGB, got her instinct buff. But like I said earlier in the video, she'll still be quite useful for farming event nodes where her dad shows up in any of the 13 versions of herself that are in the game and counting. Eh, well, maybe except Squirt. She did get a buff of her own, which lets her become a Buster crit meme all on her own, so her Buster Brave Chains are gonna hurt just about as much as her dad saying that she has no son. Combine this with her third skill that gives her a chunky defense buff, and debuff removal along with the 30% charge, and she's actually not a bad choice to take into endgame content if you love yourself some good old fashioned Morgid memes. FGO's version of Azure Lane and Girls Frontline Wedding Skins is a hybrid DPS saber whose skill set is unique in the sense that they're all targetable, allowing her to use them on whoever she wants, though to get the most mileage out of them, they're best used on just one servant at a time, including herself, which makes a lot of sense considering she's supposed to be a bride and all that. Her targetable skills also allow her to switch from support to DPS literally whenever she wants, and with her own buffed single target MP, she can smack a bitch real hard because everyone loves having a strong waifu. Her first skill in particular allowed her to enable Ark's looping memes alongside her fellow home franchise waifu Fluffy Tail, until some lean boy got a buff that made its skill better than Padoru's. DW realized this and didn't want a 5 star to get overshadowed by a 3 star because that would lose the money, so they buffed Fanny Pack's S1 to now have a 30% charge on it, which put her back on the map 
for Arts Looping memes and other janky setups. Void Cheeky is here to remind you that your Void Dust count sucks and you should go back to Charlotte to farm more of it. She has the rare distinction of having both Invul Pierce and Defense Pierce in her kit, meaning that nothing short of Guts will protect anyone she throws her MP at with her Mystic Eyes active. All the more so now that she's got an MP damage buff that adds 10% party charge as well, which seems pointless at first until you realize you're probably going to be running her in an arts team. Speaking of arts teams, she's also got the rare distinction of being a DPS with a party debuff removal in her kit, specifically on her NP. Because she's an arts saber, this means that she fits perfectly in an arts team with Tomo because the one thing Fluffy Tail doesn't have, mechanically, is a debuff removal. On that note, why wouldn't you be using Tomo in an arts team to begin with? Also, someone at the Lightworks clearly has a bunny girl fetish if they thought giving Mama Shiki a pair of bunny ears for each of her ascension stages would be enough to be called costumes. And you wonder why games like Azure Lane and Girls Frontline have skins that look like this. Kao Sushi is a buster meme who hits red buttons as much as she hits on cute guys in Shotas. She'll get along very well with Suisei, I'd imagine. Her trademark gimmick is the ability to double her own hit counts, which only she and her berserker form has. In a game where hit counts are mechanically essential to servant gameplay, being able to double it at will causes her to do some hilariously broken shit sometimes. And with an Invul Pierce, self debuff removal, and Invul of her own, she's well equipped to tackle endgame content with the proper support as usual, of course. And what do you mean you JP players don't know who this servant is? No data? You sound like she just got thanos or something. Cloud got yeeted out of FF7 Remake and found himself here in FGO, and now he's a buster meme who's a wave clear with a niche specialty against thick boys that he finally gets to use on a regular basis now that we have giants in Lost Belt 2 that you need to farm rings from for your brand new Scotties. And all this time, he's wondering why there's some dickbag who's got the same voice as him. He also got his instinct buff so that now he unloads 30 stars along with a thick crit buff. This means that paired with Annie Blonde's 20 stars, he can guarantee crits for everyone on the team, which makes a star weight buff that he's lacking to turn him into a true buster crit meme not as important. Now this, this is a real man's instinct, the kind of buster sword that Tifa, Aerith, and Yuffie really want. Kaiba is an SSR Siegfried, except he's single target, he can crit people into oblivion just like how Yugi wrecked his ass, and he can turn himself or someone else into a burst star gen for one turn. So people like Coco, Lily, Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, Yandere, Snex, Darth Maul, and Clever Girl try to keep their distance from him as much as possible whenever he's around. For all the ladies who dig guys in glasses or blue eyes white dragons, Ziggard would be your man if he wasn't already committed to a Yandere Valkyrie. And public service announcement to roll for those two together if you don't already have Bryn because it's going to be real Peppa hands if you only have one of them on your account at any given time. If only Pot Agreed lets you pull two SSRs from the gotcha, huh? <laughs> Cooper's Babylonian Dad is a Buster Crit meme with one of the strongest super effective mods in the game that lets him do bonus damage against every servant in the game except for these ones because DW didn't know how else to interpret Enuma Elish into gameplay terms. Also, being the king of strippers, I'd imagine he gets along pretty well with Jack since the two of them also like ripping people's hearts out. And with the buffs he's got to his S3 and MP over the years, he's now the walking FGO starter package who can crit farm, and handle endgame stuff because he's fucking Gilgamesh. He's also got constant rate-ups even as a limited 5-star because DW loves milking him as much as they love milking Kao Sushi. So fuck you and pay him, as expected of the game's very first limited SSR. Orion is this guy. This chick's his waifu. No, seriously. Long story short, Artemis hijacked his sink grab just because she wanted to be with her husbando, which then somehow turned him to a teddy bear. Uh, he's also one of Caldea's bigger simps with how often he chases after other girls, resulting in situations where Artemis turns him into Hershey's chocolate and the like. Since he can't do much as a teddy bear except look at ass and tits all day, whether it's his own waifus or others, Artemis has to do all the heavy lifting for him both literally and figuratively, so she's a crit archer and art stall meme who can do double damage against guys, which shouldn't be surprising given how I just described her in the previous paragraph. This also creates potential situations where you'll bring female-only buffs or go up against enemies with anti-female effects, 
only to realize that they don't work on Artemis because Orion's the Saint Graph, not her. So if you thought bringing Hololive Reject as a buffer for Orion was a good idea, maybe go easy on the Asakoko next time. And if you didn't like Orion when he was like this, you shouldn't like him when he's like this. Be careful who you make fun of in high school, as they say. In case you wonder what your boy Elon Musk does in his free time other than post memes on Twitter and do his best Snoop Dogg impression, it's being a 5-star archer in FGO. Specifically, he's a sort of alternative Gilgamesh, mechanically speaking, in that he also has a super effective mod that works against a large number of servants in the game, since a lot of servants are Earth or Sky attributes. Serbian Thanos also has a big boy 50% battery, which makes him easy to use as a farmer, a skill that increases party's MP generation rates, and an MP that has a moderate chance to stun enemies, so they're taking the whole Tesla thing pretty seriously here. Just remember that the HP Demera on his MP can actually kill him if he's got 500 or less health, not that it should happen often, but you never know, you might have another window cracking moment like Elon did with his Tesla truck. One of humanity's oldest edgelords has a gameplay style that's just as weird as his personality. He has a star gem buff that works better on him as an enemy compared to when you're using him. He has the accursed 25% battery that's super awkward to use sometimes, and has a 10 turn cooldown even at max level for some reason, and an insta-kill niche against divine enemies in a game where insta-killing is about as reliable as Hachama's English. His S1 does have a 5 turn debuff immunity effect with a 6 turn cooldown making him pretty damn convenient to use in fights that involve a lot of debuffs, and his MP itself does a shit ton of damage as you might expect from an attack that almost literally drops a black hole right on top of you, so he's got that going for him at least if you're looking for a nuke archer. If nothing else, at least you'll be able to put your ghetto scope to use with him. But honestly though, the biggest buff that he got is the fact that he's a berserker now, and y'all already know about him. And what's with Shimazaki Nobunaga and his obsession with voicing edgelords? Squirtle is THE quintessential arts meme with the ability to spam her MP with or without external support as many times as there are extra versions of herself in FGO because her idea of a water gun fight is sticking Excalibur into one and shooting people with it, and somehow that works really well. Funny how Saber is better off as a joke swimsuit character in another class in this game. There's honestly not much else to say about her, she just kinda spams her NP and eats food all day. Though I'm sure you're all used to Saber and all 13 other versions of her or something, emptying out your snack cupboard every night anyway. And if you've ever wondered where she got the swimsuit she wears in Emiya Gohan, now you know. Aqua doesn't look like an onion in this game, but rest assured her useless goddess moments are still here. They both do dumb shit like getting four Marines mixed up twice, somehow losing the Bull of Heaven, sniffing and licking herself in Azure Lane, organizing a Mario Kart race just to get her Bull of Heaven back, leaking her weight, trying to raid Gil's treasury, and getting wrecked by a bull. Uh, they're both greedy and sundere, but most importantly, they're both goddesses. But they both have their fair share of epic gamer moments too, like reaching solo diamond in Apex, speedrunning Dark Souls in Sekiro, and killing the Ender Dragon with her neighbor, even though Shion was the one who killed it and not her. In FGO terms, this translates to being both a nuke farmer and buster crit meme. Uh, dropping an entire planet on your ass like she does in her MP isn't just for show. Literally, the only thing that holds her back is the buff delay on her S3, which is painful to work with if you're not used to dealing with delay buffs, and it's still really annoying even if you are. Just think of it as that moment when Aqua realized that she's getting NTR'd by Yuri Pirate. Somehow, DW thought she wasn't epic gamer enough, so they buffed her MP, which is the equivalent of Aqua actually getting Okayu to go out with her because we thought it never happened. Well, for Aqua, it'll still never happen as long as Corona exists, but you get the idea. But with that buff, Aqua went from an A-bomb to an H-bomb, which makes a lot of sense given how many love triangles she's tried to get herself into. Uh, what do you mean her name's Ishtar? And what do you mean there's no connection between her and Aqua and I'm just trying too hard to simp for someone who's got the same energy as an onion? Evil Boomer really wishes that you'd stop calling him Evil Boomer because if anything, he'd rather be an Evil Zoomer instead. How many times do we need to teach you this lesson, old man? He's mainly a single target archer who can ignore invul with a 50% battery and a double charisma for other evil servants. He would be a crit archer too, except his star weight buff is only for one turn, and his battery costs stars to use, which makes his job as a crit archer a bit harder. However, DW decided to toss the old man a bone and buffed his battery, which now lets him force the evil alignment on his whole party, meaning that he can give anyone a double charisma effect so long as you have the stars for it, and you make sure to use his S2 first before his S3. 
Because of this, he's now a very handy universal buffer in case you don't have any other double charisma buffer who applies to your team. And even though he's an evil boomer, his biggest weakness is cute girls calling him daddy, which is probably just as bad as it sounds. Yo, Guin, I didn't know your doctor was actually James Moriarty in disguise. Napoleon Dynamite is an AoE archer and farmer with the rare distinction that Wojciki has of having both defense and invo pierce too. He's also got strong support skills of his own like a charisma that double buffs himself, party MP damage buff, and one turn party star gen buff, and his S3 is like an alternative Pioneer the Stars skill that other servants like Elon Musk, Drake, and DMV have, but instead of a 50% battery, it's only a 30%, but in exchange for a 3 turn star regen. He's a huge fanboy of Iskander, and he finds Evil Boomer's nickname hilarious, but he won't like it if you happen to own a pug. His debut in FGO brought about a sudden influx of Bada fan art, and given those pecs he's rocking in his first ascension stage, it's probably not a surprise. So if you want to go full gachi W on this game, yeah, Napoleon's a good place to start. Also, he's the closest we have to a Toho Project collaboration with how ridiculously big his hat is in his third and fourth stages. <laughs> Skaha was a Skaha before she was cool. Wait a minute. Other than being the hot teacher fetish bait in this game, she's a single target nuke lancer with power mod against divine or undead targets, though you'll be using that against divine enemies more often. She's such a strong nuke in fact, that she was the strongest single target lancer in the game until Clayboy took that from her not too long ago in JP. She's also a crit lancer and quick support, having a targetable 50% quick buff in a game where, at the time of her release, the only other quick support servant was a green cat. However, her whole crit lancer answer thing isn't very strong because whoever designed her kit thought that making her crit buff and star weight buff RNG was somehow a good idea, and NA should be at the point now where we have another Skaha to do the whole quick support thing much better. She's still the queen of shitting all over divine enemies since she gets an actual damage bonus against them, unlike Clayboy, whose bonus damage is only against threats to humanity and still only stuns divine targets, but other than that, she's now basically the Bremerton of FGO where she's more known for her lewds than anything else. At least Bremerton's top tier in Azure Lane, Skaha doesn't even have that going for her anymore. The Curry boy people actually like, especially here on NA, is an AoE nuke lancer who, just like the SSR lancer before him, is super effective against divine enemies. He's bar none the strongest AoE lancer in the game, barring weird shit like Romulus calling you a Roman ten times in a row, or something like that. So in case you happen to see an enemy Arjuna somewhere, you know what to do. He can also be used as a crit lancer, but like Shisho, he has a problem where he lacks his own star weight buff and his Lancer class doesn't really do him any favors there. At least his crit damage buff isn't RNG though. He also has that awkward as hell 25% battery that his half-brothers got, but thanks to Kano Yoshiki and him always trying to push content early out for NA, which includes Karna's animation update, the Babylonian Mystico that we got two years early is great with Karna because it's got both an extra buster buff and a 10% charge for your favorite curry boy, which is perfect if you're running him with Merlin and Waver. What do you mean you don't have your own cocksucker? Yandere's simulator is proof that if you're batshit crazy enough, you too can have an entire mechanic in FGO named after you. That mechanic is the Brynhilda's beloved trait, which makes anyone who has it take super effective damage from her if she decides to stab them in the dick. Or the Vag, since some girls have that trait too. In this sense, Bryn is also a nuke lancer, but mainly against the people she wants to cuddle with. On top of that, she's got a good dose of support effects that make her overall a hybrid DPS lancer. Enemy crit chance and MP damage reduction, a 3 turn 50% party star gem buff on her NP, and most importantly, a targetable massive star weight buff that also buffs crit damage and heals. The star weight buff is strong enough to work on berserkers to an extent too, so if there's ever a servant you want to turn into a crit monster and you don't have the best CEs to do it, that's Yuno's job. Also, if her husbando's any indication, she's into guys who rock glasses, so hopefully you guys tried wearing glasses as a catalyst when you rolled for her during Lost Bot 2. Wait a minute. Alright, I'm gonna head out now. The Saber Saber wishes she was is Saber, but not really, thanks to some weird timeline shit where she doesn't have Excalibur but has Rongo instead. Either read Camelot or wait for the movie to come out because most of you are lazy as fuck and don't read shit and you'll know why. Just like OG, Noel Shirogane is mainly a farming lancer, in part due to the fact that they share almost the exact same kit. But one of the differences is their batteries. Lartoria has 50 compared to OG's 30, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it real carefully, I'm sure. 
Also, in case Emiya finds himself having to make lots of Gyudon at Caldea all of a sudden, you have no other thing. The other thing that Lancer Tits has that Ice Cube doesn't is an Invul Pierce tied to her MP. Between that, her 50% battery, and her really good MP generation stat, she can actually become something that OG definitely isn't, which is a challenge quest memer where she can RTA certain fights because of that combination of perks she's got, which is kind of like insult to injury to Saber because she'll never have her Lancer version's tits to begin with. It's just too bad that the Lancer class has two Scotty memers who will take over the Lancer farming meta when Scotty gets here, so she's probably going to be retired when that happens. So she's really hoping you don't pull Scotty Scotty when she shows up. Fox Tits is another single target nuker, this time against guys, because she literally nukes their balls from orbit. If there were ever someone you could ask a dick flattening from, she'd be the best at it. When she's not doing her best space gen impression, she's mainly a support and utility lancer with a charisma, a thick star gen buff for any male teammates, a skill that has a charm, defense debuff, and curse effect all in one, and another skill that more or less makes her go ultra instinct for a turn if used correctly. But in true Finnegan Fox fashion, her S2 and S3 have demerits on them that include increasing an enemy's MP charge by one and having a delayed stun. That delayed stun is the biggest drawback of her kit because having one of your servants stunned or charmed is one of the most annoying things in this damn game. So as soon as command codes come out, make sure to give your own server fluffy tail one of those debuff removal or debuff immunity command codes. Now you know why the 4 star one has Tomomo's mirror on it. Apparently word on the street is that it's not gay if it's clay, but I don't think many of you mean that when the clay plays the reverse card on you. He'll show you who's the Lancer of this gym. Gil's favorite boy toy is a survival DPS Lancer, especially when he's solo. He's got a double mana burst for two of the card types at a time, with one of them always being a buster buff, a single target crit chance debuff along with an evade purge that also gives himself evade, and a thick boy 10k heal that also cleanses his own debuffs. In fact, you could argue that he's better off being solo because of his assassin deck. It's a bit weird on him at first since he's one of only two Lancers in the game with this kind of triple quick deck, but those quick cards allow him to produce stars constantly on his own, as if he were an assassin, which he can then use to power his chains the next turn without having to deal with a shitty 0.9x assassin class damage mod, because he's a lancer instead with 1.05x. He's a bit of an anti-divine specialist in that he stuns divine enemies, but it's a shame he doesn't get an actual damage bonus against them, probably because it's already someone else's job. But that's okay, because DD we gave him an MP buff anyway that makes him the strongest single target lancer in the game. And just for good measure, they also buffed his defense debuff overcharge and slapped a 200% super effective mod on his MP whenever he attacks enemies tagged as threats to humanity. Keep in mind that 200% is the same scaling that most other super effective mods in the game have at maximum overcharge level, and Enkidu gets it every time. Granted, there aren't very many things in the game that this really applies to, mainly extra classes and the weird trees that are showing up in the Lost Belts for some reason that Paul forgot to cut down, which is why Enkidu gets that 200% scaling right off the bat. But there happens to be a Berserker tree you fight somewhere along the way, assuming we even get Enkidu's buff before then. Best Renface is also another farming Lancer, and she's very similar to Lartoria in this field in that they both have thick 50% batteries, a charisma buff, and a mana burst. But mechanically, they go about it quite differently, including the fact that Ereshigal can give your team a double charisma effect thanks to her S3 synergy with her MP if she's got a Kaleidoscope and Waver or Scotty to help her out. When she's not farming, which is actually now, now that NA has Scotty unless she didn't roll her, Helltaker Simulator is a support lancer whose S3 serves as the crux of her support capabilities, since not only does it provide the attack buff synergy that I mentioned earlier, but it also busts party defense, MP generation, and max HP, which is a complicated way of saying that it turns her whole party into thick boys and gals for three turns. And daily reminder to hold hands with Modius and give her head pats and hugs every day for the epitome of Rin faces. You Ishtar simps may not like it, but this is what peak Rin face performance looks like. Real talk, Babylonia was Helltaker before it was cool. Just me first when it's done. 
Elon ain't the only one who works overtime as a 5 star servant at FGO. Your boy Drake also does the same whenever he's not being one of the world's best selling music artists, being a 5 star writer who puts in work as one of the strongest farming servants in the game, historically speaking. Oh, and he's also a girl in this game, which some of you may or may not prefer. She's got the coveted 50% battery, the first one in the game to have it in fact, which should explain a lot about how strong of a farmer she is. Not only that, but she's got great face cards, way above average star gen for a rider with only one quick card, and an MP buff to work with. And given how many caster enemies there are in the game that drop you mats that you need a lot of, Drake has plenty of work to do. One of these days, she'll make an album about all the pages she's farmed for you and to thank her later for them. Or maybe she'll make it about how, if you're watching this video, it's too late. Shoutouts to anyone who's grinding Drake first for their PR3s. Bitchy teenage drama queen thinks your waifu sucks and that you should get a new one. And it won't be her because she's too busy giving head to her dino boy toy. No wonder she's a writer. Drombeg Mead is a hybrid support writer whose kit can turn her into a challenge quest writer under the right circumstances. She's most useful for her double charisma for any of your male servants, the one turn defense debuff, and her single target MP that's super effective against guys because it involves her literally fucking them to death in case you didn't think her MP was suggested enough. She's got a charm and her MP has a mental debuff resist debuff as its overcharge, which is a fancy way of saying that she makes any enemy with a dick want to simp for her more than they already would, but her charm isn't even a guaranteed effect, which actually makes a lot of sense because not everyone is into girls who fuck entire armies at once like she does. In case you are one of those people who don't want to simp for her, make sure you cannon rush Maeve if you run into her on the ladder. Now there's a dicking she won't like. While her April Fool's art makes her a strong contender for comfiest servant in the game, she also does her best warden impression from Mob of the Dead if you get her costume from the second summer event. And they sure don't make costumes like they used to. Waver's boyfriend is a nuke AoE writer and an example of true unga bunga in FGO because his entire kit revolves around him doing damage, damage, and more damage. So much damage, in fact, that he technically does more damage than Ryder Kintoki at identical MP levels, and you already know how much damage Kintoki Ryder can pull off. He's a real bro though, because two of his skills together are basically Drake's Voyager skill but stronger, and his MP in conjunction with his S3 turns him into a burst star gen for his team, though likely he'll just end up taking the stars for himself anyway because he's a rider. His most recent buff did give an additional party crit buff though, so it does make him an even better party support in the event that he actually doesn't end up hawking all the stars for himself. It's a real shame though that because he's so unga bunga he doesn't really offer much else, so you don't really see him use used very often outside of situations where you just need someone to do a fuck ton of damage to a wave of casters somewhere. But then again, it's not like his meta viability matters much when you have this cocksucker in the game. Ozzy is the only servant in the game who can properly use Imperial Privilege because he's the only IP user who can increase his own buff success chance. If you're a zoomer and you've never felt the pain of having to use RNG skills, get ready to get vibe checked straight to hell with IP. Wow, such buff success chance, many whiff, very good. Wow. Now that you've lured his third skill, Arrogant Fuckboy number 2 is a DPS rider through and through, with Thick Boy attack bus for himself, and a single target MP that involves him smacking two pyramids together like he's trying to do his best pineapple pen impression. This is how you know Ozzy's a fucking boomer, still using 2016 memes in current year, Keck W. He can be a bit of a hybrid DPS too. He's got a charisma, and his MP has both a one turn MP seal and defense debuff against his target if they survive getting flattened by two pyramids somehow. The buff success chance gimmick he has is also party wide, meaning that he can team up with other IP users, or anyone else who's got RNG skills, in a way that not many others can. Unfortunately, the buff success chance buff being only one turn kind of limits his support capability anyway, and so is the fact that the 20% party charge on it doesn't scale. Imagine how insane of a support writer Ozzy would end up being if his party charge could scale to like 30% or something. Oh, and of course, here's an obligatory motherfucking JoJo reference for you all. Kills you in Spanish is the Latino hermana mayor you never thought you needed. And what you also didn't know is that she hangs out with Tristan in Caldea's recording studio to practice singing Despacito when no one's looking. She's very similar to Dio Simulator. They're both single target hybrid DPS riders with good support effects like charisma and strong NPs that inflict and P seal for one turn on their targets. Where Black Lagoon Simulator differs though, is her support effects themselves. She has a stronger charisma and a targetable buster buff 
that also has a complementary guts effect, allowing for solid buster support in the event that you can't bring a Merlin for some reason. In addition to her already great face cards, her third skill turns her into a one turn crit monster that basically guarantees that she'll be hogging all the stars on that turn. And perhaps most importantly, it's also got a 30% charge for herself as opposed to Ozzy's 20%, making her optimal in Waver Merlin nuke setups where you just really need to pile drive someone into the other side of the planet. I also didn't mention this back in Aqua's part of the video, but Luchadora Simulator is also part of the Caldea Goddess Club, whose members have a passive that gives them thick chunks of permanent debuff resist, and most of them, if not all, also have additional magic resist passives that give them even more permanent debuff resist on top of that. So Mira effectively has a permanent 50% chance to yeet away most debuffs that enemies try to cast on her, so she's quite nice to use in quests where enemies tend to spam debuffs faster than Sky can post more pictures of thirsty One-sans going after Shotas with 2080 Ti's and Titan RTX's. Paul Blart Mall Cop got isekai into a world where he's now a cute girl with a badass sword and a gun, and calls herself a maid for some reason, even though she's supposed to be a king. Uh, if you have any problems with the plot, just like how Rotten Tomatoes did with the Paul Blart movies, uh, yeah, please direct your complaints to Naso and ask him why we don't have a Tsukihime or Melty Blood collab yet. She's a single target nuke rider, not because of any special super effective mod that her MP has, but because she's got gimmicky skills that she can abuse to buff her damage through the roof on her own. Her S1 is her mana burst, but it's split up into two buff types, a 30% attack and 20% quick buff rolled into one, and her S3 is another 30% quick buff that has a very short cooldown at three turns at max level. Her S2, however, is a targetable skill that reduces a teammate's skill cooldowns by one. This means that Vinny, the king of Maldors, can pop her S1 and S3, then use her S2 to reduce her own skill cooldowns by 1, and wait until wave 3 while avoiding any of her other quick cards, so that she can use her S3 a second time for a total of an 88% quick buff and a 30% attack buff between her skills and passives to use with her own MP. Her S2 also gives a 50% star gem buff for 3 turns, and given that her MP is quick with 6 hits on it, she'll generate a chunk of stars too. Because of the ludicrous amounts of quick buffs that she can already give herself, she actually doesn't scale that well with Scotty, not that this will stop you from running double Scotty Malter anyway, so make sure to bring more attack buffs or MP damage buffs for Sons of Anarchy Simulator. Russian Boomer doesn't appreciate your Soviet Russia jokes, especially not when you basically spent all of Lost Belt 1 trying to Bolshevik his ass. Speaking of ass, he's also one of the chonkiest boys you'll ever have in this game. I mean, fucking look at him, he's an absolute goddamn unit. He's a DPS writer whose gameplay is very similar to the other limited AoE writer before him, which makes sense because they're the two strongest AoE writers in the game anyway. But unlike Peter Griffin's simulator though, Manny Alter has a more diverse skill set that allows him to be a bit more than just an unga bunga me press red writer, such as a self debuff cleanse, MB generation buff, star regen, invul, AoE attack debuff, and AoE enemy buff removal. So not only can Putin be your typical buster crit meme, but he can also give himself much of the additional support that a DPS servant would need to keep doing their job. Even if the other Lost Belt Kings are outright broken, he's not also a Lost Belt King for no reason. Ponako Green is the only Scotty compatible SSR writer, which is a bit ironic if you think about it. Hope you've got 2k4 as someone who can give him another MP generation buff though, otherwise you ain't looping shit. Outside of his Scotty meme role, Green Cat's younger brother can still be used as a setup farmer thanks to his 30% battery, or just as a general DPS or crit rider. As a bonus, he's also got a taunt that he can use in conjunction with his invul skill if he wants to buy his team a mostly free turn of damage if need be. And needless to say, but this is the guy gender bent Jeff Bezos keeps screaming her head off about every so often. But given what Amazon's going through right now, you'd think she'd be a bit more willing to hire his services to get more shit delivered on time these days, if my own Amazon orders are anything to go by. No, like seriously, you, do you really need me to talk about this dude? I will anyway because that's what I'm supposed to do in this video, just in case there are some of you out there who are watching a video about FGO for the first time, god forbid. Since I probably won't get another chance to say this, this is hell you're walking into, so get out while you still can. Wavy Lays is the Mr. Worldwide of FGO, the oldest and still most relevant of the big four support caches of the game because of his skills that are applicable in every imaginable context. Whenever you think of support 
support caster, this is the guy you think of because there's literally no situation where he'd be anything other than a huge asset to your team. Basically, the early game meta of FGO revolves around you fishing for support boomer and gotcha until you get him, and to that end, you're probably going to be gluing your face to the wikis, trying to figure out when his next raid up is, and debating whether or not you're going to grow the balls to roll caster GSSR specifically for him. And once you've managed to luck out and summon him, suddenly the game becomes about 50 times easier, and you start wondering why and how you even managed to get this far without him. Uh, I wish I were just meaning about this, but this is actually the case to a certain extent, for better or for worse. Oh, and in case you're wondering, Waver's next solo raid up is with Fate Zero rerun later this year. Thank me later. Fluffy Tail is your arts addiction drug dealer and enabler, just like how Coco's been drugging up her friends over at the Hololive offices, and Telmo does the same shit but with arts memes. But no, seriously, she's the Fubuki of arts memes for a reason, because she's really fucking good at making your art servants go ultra instinct, because she can both reduce your team's skill cooldowns and charge their MPs by at least 25%, something that only she can do. These effects also apply to herself, too, so her metagame involves you spamming her MP as much as possible to get your arts memes going. Support Zoomer was already good at her job of being an arts engine, but then DW gave her a third buff that makes her S1 cast a party-wide 30% MP damage buff except herself, which is kind of like saying Waver doesn't need Black Rail, like, yeah, no fucking shit, we know she doesn't need to fucking need that for herself. Not only does this make arts team damage output skyrocket through the damn roof, but it also buffs Art's looping teams that sometimes act as Scotty meme alternatives and makes them more viable. Of course, you'll probably still use Scotty memes more often, but Tamamo memes do have a few advantages over them in the right situations. And daily reminder to give your very own Finnegan Fox head pats, ear scratches, and tail fluffs every day. Or just watch their videos, that's fine too. Titty Monk's gonna bonk your ass as the horny jail if y'all don't stop masturbating to her every time you see some of her fan art and dojins like the coomers you are. She's a support DPS caster with a single target MP because she's got a taunt to protect her team and a skill that packs a 3 turn party MP gen buff, star gen buff, and 1 turn party debuff immunity, which comes in handy whenever you're trying to farm one of those annoying soul eater assholes who love spamming MP seals and such on you. Alternatively, and most likely you'll be using her this way instead, she's a setup caster and MP spammer thanks to her triple arts deck and her first skill that charges 80% of her MP instantly. This means that depending on her setup, she can nuke targets one at a time with a black rail setup or she can fire off her MP more times than people can complain about how tedious her event was. Whenever Leon gets sick of killing zombies and saving the president's daughter, he comes to FGO to be some kind of gender-bent renaissance genius for a little bit, to invent shit and be a shopkeeper for some reason. Uh, what's with FGO's tendency to gender-bend a lot of the guys coming to the game? Oh yeah, that's right, because most of us give more of a shit if there are more cute waifus in the game. She's mainly a farming caster, thanks to her thick 50% battery and AoE MP, but the rest of her kit makes her more suited towards challenge quests with guts, a 2 turn debuff immunity, HP regen, charge regen, and crit chance debuff. She's also another rare example of someone who's also got both invul and defense pierce, which also makes her more suited for endgame stuff in the right situations. She also works at the DMV as a part-timer because she needed to get her license to drive the shadow border somehow. Just don't let her run into any shady looking priests trying to sell her mapo tofu. Hey, it's the lolly from that one alarm clock app. Don't lie to me, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The class president of Caldea's Jailbait Club is a nuke caster, and she's gonna nuke your balls too if she catches you looking at her fan art on Pixiv. When she's not calling the police on you, she nukes single target assassins or berserkers, which she can do better than anyone else in her class because she's the only single target SSR caster in the game with a proper mana burst, and more coming from her MP's overcharge. Because using her MP debuffs herself though, she's meant to be a one pump chump, just like many of you. So having her kill whatever she's nuking in one go is her top priority, unlike Sanzo from earlier, who can just spam her MP as much as she wants with no downsides. Her S3 gives her a chance to be able to resist her own demerits thanks to its debuff immunity which allows you to reload the German lolly's MP and use it again with no detriment but you need to let Chloe go wild on her with her own S3 if you want to guarantee that effect. And praise Kano Yoshiki for giving NA Ilya's animation update early, along with a lot of other animations this year. And we have this fucking cocksucker. Just like Ryan's boy toy, support Coomer's reputation precedes him. Y'all know about this dude already too, don't ya? Something about buster memes and seeing red, pressing red, you know, that kind of stuff. If you're too SPS to figure out how to play the game any other way, 
this should sound real familiar to you right now. His S2 is a literal get out of jail free button and his S3 is one of the most infamously broken skills in the game. His first skill is his weakest, and even then it's still pretty damn good being a Charisma with a free 20% party charge. And his MP is mechanically similar to Tomomo's where, once it gets going, it feeds into itself over and over until Merlin's practically vomiting stars non-stop like Hachama after two bowls of spicy Korean ramen, and your whole team's charging their MPs by 20 or more percent every turn for free. So if you thought Waver was already the easy button of this game, you got another thing coming. In fact, a Fluffy Tail and Cocksucker team is a a hilarious team to use for any of your DPS servants who've got at least two arts and two buster cards. Why bother wasting your time arguing whether arts or buster is a superior meme when you can just join forces and abuse both at the same time? Chex Mix is supposed to be a challenge quest style caster with a niche against servants who are royalty, which makes sense given that she's the narrator of A Thousand and One Nights. While the list of royalty servants is pretty big, the problem is that you'll realistically only use her against this fraction of them. Even worse is that her AoE charm only works against guys, so you'll only ever really use that against these five. She does have the ability to cast party guts on a skill, and she's one of the only servants, if not the only one who can do so. Ilya's mom has it too, but it's on her MP, not a skill. This puts Dummy Thick in a niche position of being able to provide party guts on demand in case you're going to a fight where you know your frontline's about to get blasted instantly. Even still, that's really the only bit of party support that she can provide outside of her anti-king niche that you're probably not going to be putting to much use anyway, so at most she'll just be an SSR farming caster for you. For what it's worth, she can MP loop once Fluffy Tail gets her S1 buff, and she's one of the few servants in the game who's legitimately thicker than a bowl of oatmeal if you're a connoisseur of thick waifus. Kantai Collection Simulator is a farming caster, and once you get her and level her skills, you'll be putting her through FGO's version of Aurel Hell farming gears, stakes, frost, and bullets. She'd have been a perfect addition to the Italian event in Azure Lane, even if she's already in the game in two different characters. She's bar none the best AoE farming caster though, out damaging even DMV, who's got an MP interlude buff while Nero doesn't, assuming you stack all of Nero's buffs on herself. Her S1's a 50% battery, and her S3 is one hell of a drug, uh, I mean support skill, with a targetable 3 turn 50% attack buff, so in a sense, she can give anyone on her team a 3 turn mana burst. She's also great at regular face card farming too, with a good deck and really strong arts cards that make her charge her MP ridiculously quickly, and even more so if she's under half HP while her S1's active. Funnily enough, you can also use her as a sort of challenge quest DPS, because she's got Invo Pierce on her MP, her S2 lets her take only neutral damage from any classes that would normally be advantage against her, and her S3 has a guts. Just keep in mind that her S2 only applies to the damage she's taking, not dealing, so the ideal class for her to use this against is Berserkers, since she'll still do double damage against them while taking normal damage from them. And also, try not to call her a Tenga, otherwise you'll really pull her Devil Trigger. Annie wanted to try being a character in a mobile game and ended up being a Russian princess somehow. Tibbers came along too, but now he's a Metrioshka doll who stares at people until they die. She's a farming caster with the ability to loop once Fluffy Tail gets her S1 buff. And because she's a permanent SSR, if you didn't roll Imuya or Kit Kat from her summer event, you can always get spooked by Colleen and use her as your go-to farming caster for stakes or gunpowder instead, though she might not really appreciate the fact that you're making her farm for the same shit that killed her back when she was still alive. She can also be used as a sort of challenge quest caster too, because she's got an Invul Pierce, Attack Debuff, Debuff Resist Debuff, Skill Seal, and a Stun, but she's far more effective as a farmer instead. It's just unfortunate that her nickname Nastia doesn't really transfer well into English, and for the last time, she's sick and tired of your stupid little NTR jokes. And last, and probably the least of the big four, uh, support Doomer. Calling all Doomers, cause boy have I got the perfect 2D waifu for you. Contrary to many people's beliefs, she doesn't actually quote, save quick as a mechanic, in part because those people don't actually know how the game works, and in part because that would go against her whole Doomer image. What she does do, though, is carve out an entire meta of farming in the game with her debut that involves her having a threesome with herself and a third servant of your choice. This so-called Scotty system basically gets rid of a lot of the big brain team build 
building that you needed to do to farm in FGO before her release, which is a lot like what Bethesda did to Fallout. It just worked. Also, public service announcement that Scotty is just Artia in disguise. Thank you for the raid, Toho Sniper 98. Thank you. Ra. Thank you so much. Let me drop you a follow. Ah! Thanks for following my Twitch channel, Artia. Love your streams. Saga. Rules of Nature Simulator is the last kid you want to find at the Lost Kids Center at the shopping mall. Jailbait number two doesn't bother calling the FBI on your ass, instead she just fucking kills you. She's actually low-key the chief of the lolly police to make sure that you aren't being a goddamn degenerate. I'm looking at all of you who grailed Jack, by the way. Appropriate to her title of being a murder lolly, Sakuya Lily might not be able to stop time, but she can sure as hell fuck up any female enemies that aren't counterclassing her with her NP and follow-up face cards. Actually, why isn't there a Toho and Fate Dojin that involves Jack being Sakuya's daughter yet? Besides her anti-waifu power mod, Jackie Chan has a single target buff removal, crit chance debuff, and a targetable heal on a very short cooldown. Combine this with her status as the best solo star generator in the game, and she's firmly a hybrid support who's managed to stand the test of time as an SSR assassin who's always relevant, just like a smug spider, even in an era where Artia exists and threatens to turn you into ice cream and eat you if you don't roll for her this anniversary in NA. And if you Nero fanboys out there ever wanted a Nero altar, don't worry, we've always had a Nero altar back at home. Chica used to be a meme until DW buffed literally every single part of her kit, so now she ends up as the strongest single target assassin in the game, unless for some reason they give Small Parvati an MP buff, which they probably will at some point, let's be honest. But until then, she's done being a meme because she can shit all over Saber class, Rider class, and Saber face enemies as hard as she slaps the shit out of Ishigami. It used to be a joke that she was almost never damage optimal before she got all her buffs, since she literally can't use the full potential of her kit against anyone in the game, and the closest she can get is only against these five. It's actually still like that now, but that's not really a concern anymore when you're the most damaging servant in your class. Oh, how the turntables. Other than her bonkers damage, she's a great star generator in her own right, with decent support in the forms of her AoE defense debuff, AoE delay stun, and 20 star bomb in case her own star gen isn't enough. She should also have a stream collaboration with Hachama to see how much ramen they can both eat before they start puking like they've chugged bottles of Ipecac for the last piece of pie in the fridge. Shut in Doge is proof that Yuki Aoi's been doing VTuber ASMR before it was cool. She's a hybrid support assassin who also has the strongest AoE MP in her class, thanks to her MP interlude buff, and her strong support skills, one of which is basically an alternative mana burst, and her damage can get even crazier if you give her proper art support, since that's the only buff type she can't give herself. As as such, Mikoto is a great AoE rider farmer thanks to her damage potential and her sports skills that make her teammates' job at farming easier too. Mikoto should try drinking Onigoroshi on stream sometime. I am at Alter can also function as an art stall meme since her S1 is an AoE charm, even if it's RNG, and her NP spams debuffs as fast as Watame headbangs when she's binging on Asa Koko. I'd make another Hachima puking joke here, but I think twice is enough for this video. Dangan Rompa Simulator is a DPS assassin with one of the best MP generation capabilities in the game, which gets even better if her S2 is active. So her game plan revolves around her spamming her MP until either she's dead or all the enemies are dead. Also, remember that her MP is a snack, no steppy please. She can be used as a sort of challenge quest assassin DPS because she does have an invul, a self debuff cleanse, two heals, and a buff block on her MP post interlude, but there are more efficient DPSs for that. Plus, Imperial Privilege is a bitch sometimes if you don't bring Dio Simulator. What she lacks in meta viability though, she more than makes up for with style, because I don't know of another servant in this game who kills shit with literal sparkles and moonwalking. Which means Cleo's the closest you'll ever get to a light novel or manga involving Michael Jackson getting isekai'd. Also, don't let her ride the snake while she's getting over it. The game doesn't tell you, but Helltaker actually has a super secret bad ending where you go meet this guy instead. Too bad Azrael doesn't have the character design yet. Whenever Kirei is bored of being a priest, he does his best Dark Souls impression, and this is what you get the only assassin in the game, to have a berserker deck because nothing else can adequately convey how much of a fucking chad he is. He's such a chad, in fact, that when he heard people start complaining about how he needs a buff, 
he went over to DW, and they instantly gave him a double buster buff because apparently one mana burst clearly isn't enough. So yeah, uh, I guess have fun hitting big red buttons all day with the LeBron James of Assassins in FGO. Uh, at least the insta-kill on his kit makes sense, because he insta-killed your ability to turn your brain back on from using buster memes the moment you summoned him. Did you actually think someone who literally embodies the FGO player base was gonna save quick? Never mind the fact that she's an assassin on top of that. Forget saving quick, not only is that a lost cause already, but drawing dojins is more important anyway. If you're actually serious about using her as more than just eye candy and cooming, she's a support assassin who, true to her character, just sits back and lets everyone else do the heavy lifting for her, like introverts whenever the teacher gives the class group projects. It's not like her support effects are bad by any means, but the problem with Ibuki that she only has an FGO because she's an absolute monster in Azure Lane is that there's someone else who does her job of making Quicks great again better than she does, though it's not like she gives a shit, since that means she doesn't have to be the one getting dragged through the farmland of FGO and can just chill back in her room playing Animal Crossing and getting scammed by Tom again. But Closure still has use as a setup or plug suit support, and using her with a kaleidoscope despite her MP not doing any damage is actually a viable strategy somewhat since a 30% buster and quick buff is still pretty juicy along with all the other good stuff that she could provide without even having to charge you like she does in Arknights. Mac is a farming assassin thanks to her 30% battery and buster MP, which synergizes with Merlin Waver setups quite nicely. As a matter of fact, she's the first AoE assassin with a battery. No, I don't count Egyptian Shauna because her charge regen skill isn't a battery, and no, I don't count Closure either since her MP doesn't do any damage. Insert your favorite joke about DW hating assassins here. Flare has a unique caster deck as an assassin since she thought that having to stick with only one class is for plebs and decide to be part caster at the same time too, so she benefits greatly from Tamamo Merlin teams. Just keep in mind that her S3 needs at least 8 stars to use, and that her damage is a lot more potato than you might imagine, so be sure to give her plenty of buffs, including hugs and kisses from Mamakusa. Gintoki, you're in the wrong franchise again. Like most Berserkers, Gold Digger is a DPS. Specifically, he's a single target nuke who's the strongest single target Zerk in the game and does his best Ron impression every time he uses his MP. Except he doesn't ask to smash, he just smashes like the Giga Chad he is. He's the only Berserker in the game with the 50% battery, which gives him lots of setup options to do his one turn Becky smash, so he's great for farming single target enemies, especially when you don't have a ton of other single target servers to work with. With. His MP also has defense pierce, so he's a good pick for those challenge quests where enemies have a shit ton of defense buffs. However, he is a one hitter quitter, so you better make sure whatever he hits with his MP dies on the same turn. And like a lot of other traditional farmers in the game, he's gonna be mostly out of a job soon once Scotty shows up. Rad Vlad is an arts meme, which is rare for berserkers, and he's the only single target SSR arts berserker in the game. In fact, the next SSR arts berserker after him is Kao Sushi, who's AoE and they're four years apart. Naturally, he's meant to be a DPS in an arts team, with skills that both keep himself alive, with a double guts effect and defense buff, and improve his damage output with an attack buff, 30% charge, and and 3 turn 30% MP generation rate. He also has a bit of team utility with his charge drain to control enemy MPs and the star bomb as his MPs overcharge. His biggest problem, other than being a berserker who dies in 2 or 3 hits, has always been and still is the fact that DW fucked him from the beginning with a gimped MP scaling, which makes a lot of sense given what happens to him in APOC and even his MP interlude buff doesn't fully fix that. And the buff they gave to his S3 doesn't really fix any of the issues he still has, so nowadays he's most useful for spooking your rolls and mining salt from you in any other Berserker raid up banner. And speaking of another Berserker with a huge flaw, we have Mary Poppins whose idea of healing is chucking a bed at you if you don't start washing your fucking hands, you dirty weeb. She's a weird support Berserker who can heal, provide debuff immunity, and insta-kill immunity, however many times you'll be needing that, and buff someone's buster cards with mana burst for 3 turns, so in a sense, she was the Merlin before Merlin. Her MP also has a heal, party debuff cleanse, and both a 1 turn 50% attack and MP damage debuff, which basically means that any enemy who tries to use her MP on the same turn that Nurse Joy's use hers ain't gonna do shit for damage, which can come in pretty handy for moments when you don't have Merlin's illusion to save you from an enemy MP like you'd always do. But in a game where Berserkers as a class are inherently designed 
trying to do as much damage as possible before dying in 2 or 3 hits. By rejecting her Berserker gameplay, Dio Nightingale ends up being an awkward servant to use, because she just can't stay alive long enough, a lot of the time, to put the full utility of her kit to proper use. What she can do, though, is act as a setup or plug suit buffer for other servants who have demerits as part of their own kits, thanks to her debuff immunity debuff. Ilya pairs well with her for this reason, since Mercedes-Benz can use both of her support skills on her, though her mom might get a little jealous that another woman is better at supporting her daughter than she does. The original dinosaur servant in FGO, Doggo Alter, is what happens when Korone gets a little too obsessed with collecting Yubis, and now that Kijo's in the game, he can finally ditch Maeve for a proper dino waifu. He's basically Ku as a Berserker and with SSR stats, so this means that he now does big alpha male damage. How much you want to bet that all those people who hit on Ku secretly use Ku Alter all the time because they're closet Ku fanboys? He also keeps a good chunk of his survivability too, since he's still got protection from arrows, except it's only two hits instead of three, a guts, and unique to him, a skill that debuffs both enemy attack and crit chance, so that even if enemies get past his PFA, they at least can't crit him while they're debuffed, which indirectly keeps him alive longer. This makes Korone Alter a survival DPS Berserker in a game where Berserkers are meant to be glass cannons, so with sustained support, she can last much longer than other Berserkers. So make sure to support Korone as she does her best Doom Slayer impression, or anytime she does a long 10 hour stream. Damn, Watuke aged well in this game, didn't she? Your favorite Yandere Mom is still the only AoE Berserker in NA, though that'll change in a couple of months with the skeleton horse that they took from Minecraft for some reason. As such, Ragyo is still a wave clear berserker, especially when you're up against multi-class enemies, unless they happen to have weird tentacles that they got somehow from outer gods. Uh, but that still won't stop Raiko from thinking Voyager is cute. Since wave clearing someone else's job now, Kazumi does still have a Crypt Berserker niche for herself, now that she's gotten a buff to her S1 that gives her her own Crypt buff to go with her own Star Weight buff. Her S3 also gives her power mod against demonic enemies and Earth or Sky servants, which can actually double stack against servants who are Earth or Sky and demonic, which includes herself, funnily enough. Also, daily reminder to check underneath your bed to make sure she's not camping out there with the rest of the Caldea Yandere crew. MHXA is the Darth Maul meme for anyone who likes Star Wars but doesn't like anime, and her favorite places include the candy shop and your nearest Starbucks. Waifu Palpatine is an anti-saber class berserker, so she does bonus damage to all saber class enemies, not saber faces, so don't go using her against Noelle in Camelot thinking you'll get bonus damage against her. She's got a rare skill that lets her control where stars go in her team by literally force choking the stars out of their face cards on top of giving the party charisma. This, combined with her S2, that's a 20 star bomb, lets her direct stars towards one teammate's cards in particular, provided they're not a zerk like she is. Her S1 buff gives her one-time crit buffs for all three card types, which is nice since Mega and Alter works with crits a lot, at least more often than other berserkers. So this means that if crits are involved, her B and PQ chains should now be damage off. And as of Gouda 3, we now know that MHXA is a closet DMX fangirl, so now we know where she got her name from, I guess. If nothing else, she can do her best Mr. X impression by putting on her third stage costume and standing menacingly. The Doom Slayer is a DPS crit berserker who does more crit and MP damage to lower his HP is whenever he's not busy killing demons from hell. No matter what job he takes, he's always ripping and tearing somewhere in the world. Because of his gameplay gimmick of needing to have low HP in order to do more crit and MP damage, Mayo Boy dies pretty easily if you're not careful, especially because he doesn't have any survival skills of his own, because he thinks evades and invuls and shit like that are for pussies. Basically, using Tosh.0 is like playing Doom on permanent nightmare difficulty, and the only way to tone down the difficulty setting if you're a gaming journalist from Kotaku or some shit, is by playing the beginning singularities of the game. For the true Ultra Nightmare FGO experience, use Doomer Berserker in any modern challenge quest and try not to pull a Moon Moon by dying on the last stage, lol. Love the streams, Baldy. The girl you see working at your local Levi's store also happens to be a 5-star servant in FGO. Why isn't there more fan art of her actually wearing jeans? Am I the only one around here who thinks cute girls in jeans are hot? French Toast is a tank ruler. Just like her thighs and tits, her HP rating is insanely thick. 
and with her class as ruler, she's gonna be around for a while unless she's going against Zerks, Avengers, or Walking Dojin Simulator. It's a bit of a shame that she doesn't have a taunt skill of her own so that she can put her thickness to use, but you can always just give her post girl for that. Besides, everyone on Pixiv already does that for her. Genie also specializes in servant fights as a ruler support. Her S1 turns her into a 2030 for 3 turns, her S2 reduces an enemy servant's MP for a turn, and her S3 has a 120% chance to stun an enemy servant. The chance goes over 100% so that it can bypass the magic resist passive that a lot of servants have that give it a chance to guard against debuffs headed their way. And you all already know about her MP. It gives the party invul, a bit of a defense buff, debuff cleanse, and 2 turn HP regen. She's kind of like the OG Merlin in this sense, where if you can recharge her MP fast enough, she pretty much always has a party invul ready to go in case an enemy servant's about to blow their load. Thank god, literally, that she doesn't need to deal with her self-stun demerit anymore. And if she ever loses her job at Levi's, she can always consider getting a job at U-Haul since she loves cardboard boxes. Speaking of cardboard, who would win? The leader of a religious rebellion who allegedly performed miracles and walked on water, or some homunculus boy? Apoc jokes aside, Crunchbar is a challenge quest ruler, similar to French Toast, in that they're both rulers and they both have similar skills, but Makasa is a DPS ruler whose AoE MP has the terrifying effect of removing all buffs before its damage, meaning that if you ever come across him as an enemy, you better fucking kill his ass before it gets his MP charged up, which he can do pretty quickly if he spams his S2. On your side though, his game plan is to spam his MP to repeatedly deny all the enemies of their buffs and make it so that they can't ever crit because of the 30% crit chance debuff that's his MP's overcharge. In addition, he's got a buster buff to help out his damage, a servant specific stun to keep them in check, a charge regen skill that gives him full MP charge over 5 turns, and a targetable MP generation buff that he'll mostly use on himself anyway. He might always be scheming and plotting to backstab you whenever there's a grail involved, but remember that he spent 20 years doing his best Moon Moon chat impression by trying to unban elf tits, so he's a degenerate simp just like the rest of us. Also, he still doesn't get why Lucha Libre sometimes wants me to sing Despacito with him. Evil Boomer gave Genius Zoomer shit for being just a 3-star caster in Camelot, so he became a 5-star ruler instead, just so that he can rub it into Evil Boomer's face. You can also call him Mr. Steelio Kohai because Eggplant fangirls over him pretty much every night. Sherlock is a utility ruler whose MP debuffs all enemies' defense and grants party invul pierce and defense pierce, and at least a 50% crit buff because why not? I said earlier in the video that people having both invul and defense pierce in their kits are pretty rare. This motherfucker just gives it to everyone on his goddamn team. His MP is so loaded that he's probably the most infamous example of a servant people intentionally keep at level 1 so that they can use him in challenge quests with limit broken scope because all they need him for are his MP's effects. Having an S1 that both gives stars and seals an enemy's MP is just icing on the cake. So if you ever hear about people using esports Sherlocks, this is what they mean. Assuming you're not one of those Facebook whales who rolls a level 1 MP5 Sherlock though, his skills are meant to help him supercharge his MP since his S1 produces stars, his S2 collects them, and his S3 is an arts mana burst, so you can imagine how fast he can potentially charge his MP. And whoever did his animations clearly didn't know how manka giga it would get with certain servants. Yeah, Sherlock, would you kindly explain why your MP name is Elementary. Danganronpa Simulator 2.0 is an even bigger edgelord than Arjuna somehow, because posing normally is for fucking normies. In fact, the reason why Makoto poses backwards is because this used to be a bug with Arjuna sprite back in the day in JP FGO, so Dante's is pretty much one-upping Arjuna in the edgelord department. Linkin Park fanboy is a DPS Avenger, as Avengers tend to be, and he's the premier Scotty memer, the Mercedes-Benz of quick loopers in the Scotty system, so to speak which makes sense because that's his favorite car brand. It's also quite fitting that he started out as the game's first Avenger and enjoyed the spotlight for about a month before Jalter kicked him out, and then spent the next three years in tier list hell until Scotty pulled his ass back up, which is some 500 IQ analogy shit on the dev's part if that was intentional. Burnt French Toast is the formidable of FGO. They're both breakout characters in their games, they're both top tier, or at least used to be, and Pixiv goes fucking nuts over both of them. She's so popular that even Grand Blue Fantasy couldn't resist sticking in a Jalter of their own, and it won't be long until Azure Lane has their own Jalter of some kind, seeing that Dark Takao and Dark Enterprise already exist. Diesel is also a DPS Avenger, and was the OG Buster 
Mr. Crit meme even before Merlin, so you can imagine what happened when he actually showed up. She's got the highest attack stat in the game, even four years later, and she was the Zerk's worst nightmare until foreigners became a thing. You ever try fried bananas? I hear they're pretty good. Unfortunately, being an Avenger boomer, she's starting to show her age now, now that even Dante's, who's more boomer than she is, has the last laugh on her, Nobu's working on her next COD montage, and Ishtar's out there screwing around with her own MP type. But that's okay. Sometimes, you don't need to have the latest and greatest waifus in those bondos. Sometimes, all you need is a good tsundere waifu who turns your brain off every time you look at her and lets you touch your big red buttons. Lilith got fed up with Capcom not making another Darkstalkers game that she went out and became a collab character in another game by adding three letters in front of her name and pulling an Asanagi on her legs. As a result, she's now a DPS alter ego, as alter egos tend to be just like Avengers, whose only real job is to tap dance on people's faces until they're fucking dead. Her kit focuses on buffing herself more so that she can tap dance harder, and because she's part of the Goddess Essence Club and her MP removes buffs from its target, she can be used as a challenge quest alter ego, especially when Arkia joins the party. If nothing else, she can at least bully Abby and Salem if for some reason you have her and not one of the Mecha Cocos. Hachama is also glad to step on you if you insist, since y'all are a bunch of fucking degenerates, though I don't think asking someone who's gone full Edward Scissorhands but for their legs to step on you is a good idea. Maybe just give her a good butt rub instead. Kama's dysfunctional mom is the reason why we have the all women are queens meme. Maeve might use entire armies to get herself off, but Kiara uses the whole damn planet. She's also a DPS alter ego, but instead of buffing herself, her skills mainly debuff her enemies by getting rid of their buffs, reducing their defenses, and reducing one enemy's arts resistance because that's Kiara's way of saying fuck that bitch in particular. And because her MP has both a built-in invul and defense pierce, she's making sure that there's absolutely no protection involved when she goes full rants on everyone. Because of this, she can potentially make boss rush style challenge quests against against a lot of servants at once, a complete joke, especially when she's properly supported in an arts team. You can also use it for cavalry class farming, thanks to her 50% battery. Just be aware of her potato damage if you don't have high MP levels for her. Taiho might be the biggest thought in the galaxy, but that doesn't mean that she's a cheap bitch, and Demian knows that better than anyone else. If you can't keep her under control because Albacore isn't in the game, don't worry, just remember that you always have Hans. Speaking of Taiho, Minimi is still wondering why people always like to draw her with tits big than her own head. Choco Alter is, once again, a DPS alter ego, no surprise, but in her case, she's the best farming alter ego thanks to her great self buffs, Buster AoE NP, and 30% battery. In fact, at the time of her release, she was so good at farming that JP called her the best farming assassin in the game and put her in S tier, which lasted for about a month until Arkia showed up to kick ass and eat ice cream, and she's all out of ice cream. But in a world where Scotty doesn't exist, which may be some of you who managed to roll the altar but not Scotty, Snickers will still put in hella work for you. And if you have both Strawberry Saber and Choco Saber, you can make your very own Neapolitan ice cream sandwich. This is the best kind of Octodosians, by the way. Skyrim Lockpick Simulator is proof that after all this time, Johnny Bravo did manage to get laid. Makes you kind of wonder who the mom is, though. The vice president of Caldea's Jailbait Club is a hybrid sport foreigner whose skills both buff the team's NP damage and soften up enemies to make them easier to deal with. Foreigners as a class also have true class advantage against Berserkers, so she's the ideal low-level account servant because she can deal with Berserker bosses easily who'd otherwise give beginners a hard time and helps your team farm a bit more efficiently. Genderbent Sora also took a leaf out of Big Kusa's bible and stole his buff removal before damage mechanic, so now her MP does the same thing, just against single targets. Hopefully you didn't find that out the hard way when you met her in Salem. Foreigners also have double damage against themselves just on a side note, so whenever you're facing another foreigner and you either don't have an alter ego of your own, or you just want to spice things up a bit, whip out your own Abby and show them who's boss. And daily reminder that someone at the Lightworks approved a character design that's an American 12 year old girl who gains the power to control hentai tentacles, uh, loses clothing past her first stage, and gets put into a class called Foreigner. Thanks Japan. Very cool. And just in case you never want to see Abby the same way again, she's canonically taller than Nero. Imagine being a fully grown woman and still being shorter than a 12 year old lolly. Japanese Bob Ross is what happened when someone at DW finally realized how bad it sounds calling an American lolly a quote foreigner 
so they released Iofi not even a month later just so that they wouldn't get shit for calling non-Japanese servants filthy gaijins. C2 is a DPS foreigner, specifically she's an arts meme foreigner with a super effective mod against man attribute servants and enemies, making her useful for both farming and challenge quests in certain situations. In order to do that, she does her best Jigglypuff impression if people start shit-talking her paintings. And because Azure Lane clearly doesn't have enough Fate references in it yet, somehow Hokusai ended up as a destroyer in that game too, for a part-time job, I guess. And there you have it, all the SSRs in NAFGO up until NA's 3rd anniversary. Y'all seem to like these kinds of videos, so I'm more than happy to do these every year cause fresh memes are serious business. Nobody likes stale as fuck memes, right? Just a bit of shilling here towards the end, so bear with me. I've got a Twitch channel where I stream FGO and other gacha games, same as my YouTube, link in the description. If watching Gotcha Salt live or just chilling while watching a dude farm the same node for 6 hours in a row is your thing, come on by and drop the channel a follow to catch a stream or two. I will also be legitimately starting my own Arknights account on stream whenever Nian gets announced, so you Arkweebs might be interested in that. I'm also a fanfic writer in my spare time whenever I'm not streaming or making videos. The two that I'm currently working on are a quintessential quintuplets one and an FGO one, not surprisingly, so if reading fanfics is your thing, I'd appreciate it if you give those read and see if you like them. If not, that's fine too. And of course, if you like the memes in this video, be sure to subscribe. I've got a playlist of other how-to videos that focus on individual servants, so check it out in case there's a video on a servant you like, and I'll be working on more in the future. And now that NA has the follow feature, feel free to follow this friend code that you see on screen now if you've got an account that's still going through part 1's main story. And last, but certainly not least, I'll be working on another video like this one, this time on all the 4-star servants in FGO. That should come within the next couple of weeks, so I hope you'll be looking forward to that. And that's it for me. Thanks for watching. Links to the images and fan arts that I use in this video are in the description as always. And make sure to check out Hololive because I'm a degenerate Hololive simp, in case you couldn't tell already. So until next time, deuces.